Of course, we also had our own side event today, side event hosted by Students for Sensible Drug Policy and co-hosted by ourselves. Uh, this was titled The Impact of COVID-19 on Young People's Drug Use. So we had a number of good speakers presenting the research that they had done since the start of the pandemic. Uh, we had MJ and Carolina from YouthRise speaking at this, and we also had SSDP UK speaking at this. They sent in a video, uh, couldn't be there in person or, or online virtually, I guess. Uh, the video of this side event will be made available soon, but in the meantime, I shall tell you about what I spoke about. So I was talking about the COVID relief smart grants that we were able to distribute to uh, three of our members in three different countries. We gave out four different COVID grants. So we have two to Nepal, uh, we have one to Pakistan and one to Argentina. Uh, these grants were then used to meet the, the needs of young people who use drugs on the ground. Uh, these needs had changed a lot since the start of the pandemic. They had become a lot more severe in most cases. And uh, these needs were not being met by traditional services or services that were available to them before. Um, healthcare services have been disrupted a lot, obviously, but so have other social supports. Um, potentially, young people who use drugs have lost their sources of income, stuff like this, where um, youth has had to step in to meet these needs. Um, if it wasn't for us, potentially they wouldn't be met. I mean, there's still a lot of needs that we haven't managed to, to uh, meet. We are really just scratching the, the tip of the iceberg at this stage, but we were able to distribute some food relief packs. We were able to distribute some personal protective equipment. Um, we were able to create specific harm reduction resources within the context of COVID and distribute those around uh, Buenos Aires. In that case, in Pakistan, there was also a meeting with journalists held to discuss the national drug strategy, uh, which was created in 2019. The hope was that this meeting would allow for uh, better coverage of young people who use drugs, better understanding of their needs among the general population, uh, as it has been quite poor coverage. Many journalists have actually been involved in police operations to arrest young people who use drugs in Pakistan. And uh, the outreach work that was done as part of this project in Pakistan was going into very rural communities uh, very low literacy, literacy levels in these communities and these communities hadn't really received any harm reduction advice or anyone talking about drug use in the past despite having quite high levels of drug use. So it was really great to be able to reach these offline, hard to reach communities which had been forgotten by the by the COVID response as well as reaching the most marginalised people, the, the young people who use drugs who, who needed it most, uh, who had been left behind and Thankfully, we were able to bridge some of the ever widening gap, it seems, from the pandemic. But like I said, this is really just the tip of the iceberg and there needs to be more done to meet these needs. The first side event I attended today was about the VNGOC ad hoc working group uh, in the Asia Pacific region. So the VNGOC is, is the Vienna NGO committee. This is a committee which Youthrise is a member of. Uh, and this ad hoc working group was set up with the goal of expanding uh, NGO involvement at a UN level uh, at the UNODC office in Vienna to hopefully encourage new members to apply and encourage engagement for old members as well. So there was two uh, speakers at this, one from Macau and one from Malaysia, uh, both promoting the work of the ad hoc working group, which was founded in, in 2019, as well as their own work. Uh, the organisation from Macau was speaking about the harm reduction work they're doing. They implemented a needle and syringe programme a number of years ago and since 2015 have found that there has been zero new HIV infections among people who inject drugs in Macau, which is a really great achievement. Hi, so this morning I attended a side event titled Maritime Drug Traffic in, in the South Pacific. Um, and it was, it's not the, quite the type of event I usually would attend, so it was kind of interesting to have that, um, to kind of gain that knowledge on, on maritime drug trafficking. Um, so they basically talked about the cocaine highway uh, from South American countries to across the ocean to the Pacific um, Islands and then onto Australia being the destination. Um, and within that, they were talking about some of the like um, push and pull factors of the of this route. Um, so things like there's a rise in coca cultivated area, um, 
areas in South America uh, the push, as a push factor and like a pull factor being that there is high cocaine prices in Australia so and growing drug consumption recently. Um, they also went through the different kind of um, popular methods of, of trafficking. So there's like the direct shipment method, which is just like a one large vessel that goes across and then a small vessel meets it on land. Then there is a pleasure craft transit method, um, which has more impact on the Pacific Islands, um, South Pacific Islands, uh, which is more like um, with yachts and stuff. So in yacht season, there'll be like a yacht that goes out and um, will do the like a similar movement to the other yachts but then collect drugs on the way and then there's the relay transfer method uh which is a lot more complex and um they said it's way harder to catch um the drugs out and through this method and then they had um people who work in this field um from like the cook islands from fiji from a, a variety of those south pacific islands coming on and talking about the trends in those islands and um what it is that it looks like to be living there with all of that happening um and yeah no mention of youth at all but still a very interesting um event that gave me more knowledge on the the trends in, in drug trafficking um from the maritime perspective reporting day three <clears throat> I attended the side event protecting civil society space at times of uh, COVID-19. Lesson learned for advocacy, uh, which was the main title, which was organized by Yoda, Youth Organization for Drug Actions, and the Center on Drug Policy Evaluation, Frontline AIDS, and IDPC, International Drug Policy Consortium, where uh, the panelists presented about the true meaning of a civil space, uh, which is the environment that enables people and groups uh, to participate meaningfully in the political, economic, social and cultural life of the society. It also uh, presented about uh, three P's, which are uh, promotions, protections and participation. The event also talked uh, about innovations and resilience in times of uh, crisis, civil society advocacy for drug policy reform. Uh, under the COVID-19 pandemic, which was uh, quite supportive for people working in civil society organizations. Panelists uh, also talked about uh, COVID drugs and civil society linkages in Central Eastern Europe in, on uh, 2020 to 2021. And I really enjoyed the overall sessions and which was also quite informative as well, like every other day. Thank you. Hi again. I just came back from the side event about um, social and, emotion, and emotional learning as a systemic prevention approach, not merely an intervention. And I think it was super interesting uh, interesting session because even this side event was a uh, focus on the first childhood because we all learn our first emotional and social learnings um, uh, at the beginning of our life. It's super, super important that we should keep this social and emotional learning through our whole life <laughs> to, um, because an, a mature and a healthy uh, emotional management and social management uh, contributes uh, and uh, a good system of uh, taking making decisions good decisions for me for my environment and for life so I think it's a super interesting point of view and of course it um, increased the importance of prevention of the prevention fields Another event I attended was social and emotional learning as a systemic prevention approach, not merely an intervention. Uh, the main points of the event were what social and emotional learning is, uh, how it can be a tool of prevention, and it can help prevent people from having uh, drug use related disorders, and how it start, uh, the best prevention, the best social emotional learning starts as early as possible in the family, 
it can start with educating parents on how to be good parents to their child. Uh, the topic of youth and kids was uh, talked about in detail and the event was very informational and I liked attending it very much. The final side event I went to today was titled The Changing Face of the Global Cocaine Market, Reading the Trends to Respond with Foresight. And from what I saw, do not have any confidence that they will read the trends and respond with foresight, if I'm being honest. There's two speakers, one from Europol, one from the Ecuadorian National Police. Uh, there's actually a speaker before this, but I, I missed that person because I was delayed coming from our side event. The speaker from Europol discussed the change in cocaine market in Europe, uh, discussed the um, new trafficking routes that they're seeing through Africa, as well as new labs that they're seeing. Uh, he said that there's unprecedented quantities, quantities of cocaine in the EU at the moment. The person from the Ecuadorian National Police showed us some pictures of the trafficking routes that um, are being taken through from Ecuador through Latin America and into North America uh, using Guatemala or Mexico and showed us some of the seizures that they made. However, the most, the two photos that he showed us were of boats that were seized in 2010 and 2017 and um, doesn't necessarily bode very well for their recent attempts to disrupt the cocaine market. So I attended um, another event today, side event titled Inequities Laid Bare, um, responding to challenges of COVID-19 and beyond. Um, it was basically an event discussing the kind of challenges of COVID-19 um, in Canada and amongst um, services for people who use drugs in Canada. And there was a few, like there was interesting speakers. Uh, we had Michael Nurse, who was speaking from the perspective of a person um, of African descent and uh, someone who is providing services to people of African descent who use drugs. Um, then we also had May Cat, who was speaking from the place of um, working within and being part of an indigenous community um, and the kind of supports that happen around that and the effect and then there was uh, Alicia Di Giacchino uh, who was speaking from the place of a person who use a person who uses drugs um, and who has gone through uh, who has substance use disorder and has gone through treatment and supports like that um, so it was an interesting discussion there was no discussion on youth until I've asked a question later on, um, but they were, um, Michael Nurse was making some good points about how um, there is very little support for people of African descent um, and within the communities themselves there is a lot of stigma for people who use drugs and that uh, COVID-19 has basically left them feeling abandoned for the services that were there being taken away and being left with pretty much nothing. Um, and that there's no sense of leadership or who to turn to within his community. May Kat, the woman who uh, is works with an indigenous community, she said that um, basically they have been trying to adapt and mould to be able to have the supports, but she gave a lot more information when she was talking to um, answering my question on youth. So the question I asked was, um, I'm wondering what is being done to reduce the inequalities in service provision of being a young person who uses drugs and the responses to the compounded stigma that we experience. So um, May answered on this first and she said that the, her communities embrace young people, that they speak um, they speak to a youth council and work with the youth council to provide um, virtual education on drugs and um, support for people who use drugs in the community and then it was basically all about how they support and listen to youth. And Michael um, responded saying that he's envious of May's experience because such is not the case for people of African descent. Um, there is very little ability to focus on um, youth as much as there is an ability to focus on uh, the general population of people of African descent, especially ones people, people using drugs. Um, and that they, people are not really listening to the youth um, and that youth experiences are not being addressed and youth experiences that are resulting in substance use disorders is not being addressed either. Um, he basically was stating that it is important that young people are able to be heard and um, can lead their, their own lives and make their own choices and feel like they have the ability to do that. The third event I participated in yesterday was Reframing global prevention practices and policies during COVID-19. 
the event focused on the ways pandemic affected the prevention and how people now have less access to prevention services and which communities are the most vulnerable and the topic of youth was talked about separately and youth was included in the subject. Hey everyone, Anami Michael, International Working Group member from Kenya, reporting on CND64, side event, ensuring access to measures for prevention of mother to child transmission of HIV among women who use drugs and those in prison. This event was organized by UNODC HIV and AIDS section, supported by Norway, Sweden, and the International Network of People Who Use Drugs. Discussions by all speakers were very comprehensive, with reference to UN AIDS strategy on HIV. Barriers and gaps ranging from stigma, criminalization, child custody, denial of services, and closure of harm reduction services due to COVID-19 were identified as factors that led to new HIV infections. Speakers in the side event unanimously agreed that there is need to understand the barriers and focus on access to harm reduction as an entry point to other services for women who use drugs. Judy Chan from Input made a couple of recommendations. One, having a gender sensitive harm reduction service for women who use drugs focusing on laws that criminalize women who use drugs, social and legal support for women who use drugs, as well as community empowerment for women who use drugs so that they can be in a position to articulate for their needs. Thank you. Hi, I was now at this side event of um, New challenges for cyber security and illicit drug trafficking and consumption in the era of COVID-19. And basically we heard the results of the um, research that uh, Russia made about public opinion on cyber security, uh, use of internet and new technologies. And the main point was jails are easy to prevent drug consumption uh, because we are into all these technologies. So for uh, Russian police, it's easy to prevent drug consumption on Jaws. Mm, I don't think so because uh, their own results of this research said all the internet users are growing, uh, cyber crime is growing, new psychoactive substances and new markets are opening thanks to internet. So. I don't think it's that easy, but it's good to, uh, to know that Russia counts on Yaws somehow. Hi, I just uh, came from the side event of consequences of legalizing cannabis on Yaws. And okay, they talk a lot of side effects and consequences, bad consequences for the of uh, who use cannabis. Uh, I am not going to say that it's not true because there's some studies that uh, they confirm this, but you have to be more flexible because not all the yells, uh, we have the same problems. And also, if you are going to base your discourse, uh, your speech, based on Colorado's data or US data, uh, that it's not fair because they just uh, spent like five years or not that much time uh, with cannabis uh, on under these legalization terms. So I think it's a little bit fair if we wait uh, a bit more of the results of the consequences of uh, cannabis use on Yelp. I think it's too early to say something, but um, also mm, you need to be more specific and more flexible. I also went to a side event today entitled Inspiring Community Action in the Rehabilitation and Reintegration of Offenders. So this was hosted by uh, the government of Singapore with speakers from the Singapore Prison Service uh, Hong Kong Correctional Services Department, Japan Correction Bureau, 
and UNODC. So, <clears throat> as you might imagine, this was a very incarceration focused side event, uh, not really in line with Euthyrus's work. Uh, the person from Hong Kong was discussing how work is important to maintain abstinence. Um, the person from Japan was discussing family therapy and how it reduces delinquency. Um, yeah, not really great stuff from this side event, uh, but again, always interesting to see what people on the other side of the argument uh, are saying and don't really have much faith that it will lead to um, reduced harm for people who use drugs. Yesterday, I attended a side event promoting attitudes and actions that reduce stigmatization of drug use and drug addiction. Uh, the main points of the event were the ways stigma harms drug users and how uh, people with intersecting identities can be the most vulnerable to it and also how widespread stigmatizing language is and it can be found even in you know the see official documents uh, the topic of youth was touched during the event in the context of young people being uh, the most vulnerable to it uh, overall the event was uh, very helpful as an overview of problem of stigma in the community of drug users I also attended an aside event today titled The Death Penalty for Drug Offences in the COVID-19 Pandemic Era and within that they had um, a number of really interesting speakers. The first one was someone from Mongolia um, describing the situation there and they said that they got rid of the death penalty in 2010 um, but there is a lot of efforts in the country to bring it back for certain cases um, including a child like paedophilia I think. Um, also, we had some speakers such as um, Zavid Mahmoud, who uh, was explaining that we are, we are celebrating five years of the UNGAS agreement, um, and within that, human rights is, is is the main thing that was agreed on, but the death penalty is not specifically mentioned within the statement. and. Um, it's a bit of a frustration for them, but that also we need to look at how the death penalty is not in line with human rights standards or proportionality, which is mentioned in the UNGAS document. Uh, we also had Ajeng Larasati, uh, the human rights um, officer for Harm Reduction International, which were the guys who helped organize this event. Um, and she was describing the findings from the new report by Harm Reduction International stating that uh, the death penalty for drug offences um, is still existing in 35 countries worldwide um, but she confirmed that con that executions fell significantly in 2020 because of COVID-19 uh, and while that is something that is positive we also need to focus on the fact that um, after this pandemic they could easily ride back up, rise back up and it's really important that we continue our advocacy around drug policy reform and uh, the abolition of the death penalty. And then the second half of the event was really interesting. There was um, Mary Utami's daughter, who the Harm Reduction International have done a lot of work around. And there's a video um, that is incredible, um, if you look it up, about how she's been sentenced to death for um, drug trafficking. But it really, she's a victim um, of the system. And she, her daughter came on to talk to us today. Um, and then we also had the, a lawyer who is helping with the Mary Utami case um, also come on and describe her situation and what they're doing and the struggles they have in Indonesia. Um, yeah, I think that was all I had to report on that. Not a lot of talk about youth, but that wasn't really the focus of it. Um, it was just interesting to learn about the death penalty and the kind of trends that's happened in the past year. And then also to feel that push to continue to fight for drug policy reform and abolition of it, because as we all know, it's, it's completely against human rights.